Good morning, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, organizers, uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, to share my knowledge a little bit with you today. Uh, I will be very brief and make it very simple because I understand that today uh, the audience might be undergraduate and possibly postgraduate students as well. So I'll be talking a little bit about aquatic fungi, their taxonomy and their importance, but I will focus mostly on the DNA aspect about how possibly uh, important is DNA in the taxonomy of aquatic fungi, but this can be applied to any type of fungi that we talk about today. So when we talk about fungi, I'm pretty sure what mostly pops into your mind is mushroom. Yes, fungi are mushrooms, but you will be surprised that most of them that exist in the environment uh, are mostly microscopic fungi. So what are fungi? They're usually single celled organism. They could be yeast, the famous saccharomyces that we use in the making of bread or even you know, many alcoholic drinks. They could be multicellular filamentous uh, fungi, those that colonize uh, our bread, those bread molds, or they could be macroscopic. Uh, fungi, especially those mushrooms that we eat. But again, uh, having said this, I will say that most of them are microscopic. They are ubiquitous, very diverse. You name the habitats and they are there. In the air, land, soil, you know, uh, plant material, in seawater, uh, even in freshwater. And what's amazing about fungi is that they've got two states of reproduction. They can reproduce asexually and they can reproduce sexually as well. This is uh, a major advantage about why fungi can colonize uh, a diverse range of habitats. They are also economically very important. They exist as pathogens on many plants, but they also act as pathogens on human beings as well. And most importantly, they are very important in the recycling of nutrients, especially in, in leaf litter, on, on woods, in forest. And above all, they are being exploited nowadays in the food and pharmaceutical industry. They are also important in bioremediation, especially when it comes to oil spills. They can, they can also act as modal organisms, especially in many laboratories, were using one species called Neurospora as model uh, organisms to investigate a lot of biological processes. So what are aquatic fungi? Obviously, there must be fungi that resides in an aquatic environment. They're mostly uh, microscopic. They've got mycelia and hyphae. Uh, that develop on or within the submerged organic substrates. The substrates could be of animal origin or it could be plant, especially submerged wood. You know, uh, it could be leaf litter uh, in submerged aquatic environment. They complete their life cycle in the environment as well. And surprisingly, these fungi are very well adapted to live in the aquatic environment. You can find them in freshwater. They could be there in the marine habitats, in deep seas. They could be in estuarine environments as well. And freshwater fungi, they're mostly asexual fungi. And they got relatively large branch spores. Those spores are basically reproductive structures. And you can also grow those are uh, asexual fungi in the lab in vitro, especially on plates. Uh, the basic structures 
you will see with most of the acyxal fungi, they exist as high formine seeds, uh, which is basically uh, a conidiophore in here, which is a, like a long branch structure. And then you've got the spores on the top. Or sometimes they exist or they're being referred to as silomyces because they've got a silome. A silome <coughs> means a cavity. And they are integrated in the plant substrate. And then you see the spores inside in here. The conidium is equivalent to the spore. And what happens is whenever there is favorable condition, this uh, epidermis layer in here will break open and the spores will, released, will be released to colonize other habitats. When it comes to spores now, again, uh, Canadia, uh, these are, exist in different shapes and in different colors as well. Some of them could be non-septate, some of them could be having septa in here. Some of them might be of different colors, as you can see in here. And these are quite important because these are being used to identify species. And sometimes these criteria are being used or these morphologies are being used to separate a species. We've got different shapes, a wide variety of shapes when it comes to the spores of uh, uh, aquatic fungi. You will see many of them have been recovered as tetraradiate, a bit like star shape. That is, they've got like hands, <clears throat> and these act uh, to anchor or to attach uh, the spores or to entrap them on their substrates. Um, we also have a lot of spores that got appendage-like structures uh, at the top or at the bottom of the spores. And these, again, are very important structures that help those aquatic fungi to survive and to thrive in those environments. Uh, we also have sheath. This is basically a spore. And what you see in here is a large mucilaginous sheath. Why, are, why do those spores have these? Because these help those uh, fungi to float in the water. We also have spores having appendage-like structures in here and these are very important for attachment to new surfaces and to help them uh, in their life cycle so again sheath and appendages which basically uh, characterizes um, fresh or marine water fungi now importance one of the most uh, important aspect of fungi, not only in an aquatic environment, but in a most environment, is that they help to regulate the ecosystem functions. They help a very important role in the recycling of nutrients. They are capable of decomposing organic matter, whether it's leaf or submerged wood, whether, whether it is dead animals as well, okay? And how can they do that? is basically by producing a range of hydrolytic enzymes on the substrates, such as wood, leaf litter, and any type of herbaceous debris. So again, in here, they are very important in the recycling of nutrients. But apart from recycling of nutrients, nowadays research are being carried out, and it has been found that fungi are prolific producers of secondary metaboloids. And these metaboloids can be exploited for uh, commercial purposes. These fungi are ecologically, morphologically, physiologically, phylogenetically, and chemically diverse. And they can be seen in nearly all types of environments. And 
and a lot of studies, uh, many of those fungi have been found to have promising bioactivities. For example, Halinospora, which was isolated from submerged wood collected in a stream, have been found to possess compounds with moderate cytotoxic uh, activity on cancer cell lines. They also suppress the growth of leukemic cells. And many others have been found to have antibacterial activities as well. Now, coming to the second part of my talk today, I'll, I would like to focus a little bit on the current use of DNA sequence data in fungal taxonomy. Uh, before I embark on DNA, before I embark on DNA, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, fungal taxonomy in very in general. What we usually do whenever we describe a fungi, we describe it first using characters. For example, spore color, the shape of the spore. And then we try to identify. Identification is a very important aspect. We try to associate that particular taxon, taxon means that particular uh, fungus, with a known one. How? By using a key, call it taxonomic key, or we try to compare it with a photograph or a specimen, or sometimes we ask an expert in there. Then nomenclature, we try to give it name, whether it is similar name to one which is already there, or possibly it's a new species, then you give it a new name. And then what you do is you try to classify that particular fungus. So you try to put it in a scheme. Does it belong to that particular genus? Does it belong to that particular family or order? Now, when we talk about taxonomy, uh, under most circumstances, we've got two major branches nowadays. We've got the morphological taxonomy and we have the phylogenetic taxonomy. When we talk about the morphological taxonomy, we try to classify those fungi based on the similarities of phenotypic characters, that is, those morphs that they have. However, when we talk about phylogenetic taxonomy, we try to classify those organisms by clades in a particular phylogenetic tree. And then from that tree, we've got branches where we try to infer evolutionary relationships. That is how each organism is related to one another. And this is the trend that we are taking nowadays in modern fungal research. So now the question arises, are we going to use morphology to identify or investigate relationships, or are we going to use DNA sequence data? Now, there are problems with morphological characters. I've shown you a photograph before where sometimes it's very difficult to resolve relationships based only on morphology of those uh, organisms, because those morphological characters sometimes are inadequate, reduced, missing, overlap, or possibly they have undergone convergent evolution, where you might have different uh, taxa, different types of fungi that have similar characters. And when it comes to classification, if you base yourself only on morphology, it's very difficult to classify them, for example, in an order or possibly in a family. And if those fungi have got similar morphology, that does not necessarily mean that they are related to each other. Sometimes, there could be the problem of recognizing cryptic species. If we're dealing with species, fine. But the moment you go below species level, it's very difficult to identify them based on your morphology because the morphology is almost the same. 
And as I mentioned before, fungi usually exist in two stages, sexual and asexual stage. And now what happens is this creates some domain cultural problems. That is how to name those species because the same fungus can have different morphs under sexual and under asexual uh, conditions. So basically, should we give two names to those different species? So this again creates a problem when it comes to classification based on morphological characters. Uh, just to give you uh, a simple overview of the taxonomic problems in penicillium, which is uh, a very common uh, fungal microorganisms, when you try to see uh, their cultures, okay, their fruiting bodies, okay, they are largely similar among different species. So the problem arises about how to differentiate them, how many species are there, and which character is unique to each species. So all these problems crop up sometimes whenever we have a particular genus where we have many species in that particular genus. Now, the advantage that we have whenever we go ahead with DNA, so many mycologists nowadays, many fungal uh, taxonomists as well, are using DNA in order to resolve a lot of problems related to taxonomy when it comes to those fungal microorganisms. Uh, with DNA, you get a more reliable scheme of classification. You've got more molecular characters to analyze. You know, uh, one, one particular character can have four different states, A, C, G, T. It's very easier. It's, it's very easy to uh, interpret if you have an adenine, it is an adenine. But on the other hand, if you have a particular morph, morph some, someone can tell you that, no, I think this is a round shape. The other one can tell you, no, I think most of them are oval shaped. So we don't have that problem with DNA. And whenever you examine the genes, you will see that it accumulates mutations at different rates. So it's possible to examine relationships at different taxonomic level whenever you use DNA. Sometimes we can uh, try to come up with barcodes that is specific DNA sequences that can be used for species identifications. And with DNA, you can try to design primers as well for specific plant pathogens, and which is very important for plant pathologists as well. Okay, again, with uh, DNA, you can try to construct, as you can see over here on the right-hand side, a phylogenetic tree, okay, where you can try to understand genealogical ties, evolutionary relationships different between different types of organisms. You can also try to map characters. For example, when you've got characters, morphologies, of a specific groups of fungi, you can try to map them on your tree and try to understand how those uh, fungi are related to each other. Or you can also try to understand about which characters are more primitive and which characters have recently evolved. You can try with a tree to estimate the time of divergence between organisms. That is, you apply a molecular clock in your tray, and on that molecular clock, you've got a time scale, and you get an overview about which fungi evolved at each time. It also helps us to understand, to a certain extent, about how species are arising from pre-existing species, that is, those new species, for example, and it helps us to better understand speciation events as well. Now, uh, let me take you very quickly to uh, a journey into the world of molecular phylogenetics, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how you guys can, if ever you want to design a phylogenetic study, or whether you're studying, let's say, plants or even uh, any types of microbes, what precautions can you take and how you can go ahead and plan your phylogenetic study. 
Okay. Quickly, okay, before we start, this is an overview of the steps. Basically, once you have your sample, it could be, uh, I mean, even plant sample, even fungal sample, or even like bacterial sample. So you go ahead with uh, DNA extraction, and then you go for PCR. So what you do is, once you have your uh, PCR product, which could be uh, 1,000 base pairs, it could be 600 base pairs, it depends upon which desired gene you want to amplify. Then you sequence that particular gene fragment. Once you sequence it, you have your DNA sequences. Then what you need to do is basically align your species with other species as well. You've got a myriad of sequences uh, deposited in gene bank. So you can try to take the sequence, DNA sequence that you have got from your microorganisms and align it from those existing in databases. And then there are a number of softwares nowadays that you can use to uh, infer or to analyze those sequences that you've generated. And basically you feed them in there and they give you a tree. And with that particular tree, you can try to infer about which species are more closely related to each one. For example, you've got clades in here, and this gives you a rough idea that, for example, species one, two, and three would be more closely related to each other than species six, seven, eight, and nine. So based on this, you can try to infer a little bit about taxonomic relationships. Again in here, uh, this is what I said before. So you've got your alignment in here. When you align your species, you know, and these will give, will give you clades. And basically from those clades in here, you can try to infer taxonomic relationship. An example of a phylogenetic piece of work, if you, are, if you guys want to do a piece of phylogenetic work and include DNA in, in your study, what you need to do is look for an interesting topic, try to review all the updated literature, try to identify what are the gaps in there, what is missing, is there a problem, for example, with the morphology, or if you want to investigate, for example, how those microbes have evolved, or maybe if you want to know to a certain extent about how uh, possibly they are diverse, so you decide on what needs to be done. OK, you write a proposal, talk to your supervisor. And then once you get ideas, you redesign your phylogenetic study again. Then you see like an appropriate methodology. You know, uh, the most important point in here is about selection of genes. OK, you might wonder about which genes am I going uh, to uh, possibly amplify for my PCO and then come up with a proper phylogenetic study because you can't uh, usually for one for, for a lot of species sequence the entire genome it will cost you a lot and it's very time consuming so uh further studies so you can go ahead you know and try to check which cultures you have which specimens you have try to examine their morphology and then you analyze the dna characters then obviously usually as most people do they try to write a paper and submit it to an appropriate journal. Just to give you an idea, this is a group of fungi that uh, we did uh, some investigations. Okay, so we use a combination of both morphology and DNA base sequences. So we selected uh, four different genera in here. So we know about their morphology, how all the spores in here. Okay, and we wanted to investigate about whether these represent. Uh, let's say different taxonomic entities and how far these particular different fungi are related to each other. So what we did was we generate our tree and I will not go into detail, but this is just to tell you a little bit about whenever you generate your tree, sometimes you can come up with a new findings, for example, uh, in here, you will see if many people use spore sheath to separate the species, but sometimes based on your phylogeny, you see that those two different genera are mixed 
in one particular clade and therefore you might question yourself about whether uh, you can use that particular character to segregate the species on the other hand as i mentioned before you can try to map your different uh, characters on your specific branches that is clades in here just to get a rough idea about how there is a consistency between your dna based scheme and your morphology based scheme now as i mentioned again before uh, if you're going for dna based study you've got to select a particular gene <clears throat> that you want to use for maybe your uh, taxonomic studies so this depends upon your taxa and the amount of divergence between them there are a number of uh, genes that have been used in fungal systematics but the most widely used one are those from the ribosomal dna especially we've got the large subunit the small subunit and the ids region as well why are we've gone for that uh, for decades now because they are quite universal and they are very easy to amplify as well and for the time being we do have a lot of uh, DNA sequences from the ribosomal chain, and this allows comparison to be made as well. Just to give an idea, I'm not going into detail again, okay? This is your RDNA, and usually you have the NS1 region, okay, which is an 18S. If you want to go for relationships at higher taxonomic level, for example, if you want to investigate relationships between different types of families or orders, then you can select a gene, that, that particular gene in here, and sequence the DNA. If you want to investigate maybe a familial or generic relationships, then you can opt for the 28S uh, DNA or DNA. If you want to investigate maybe phylogenetic relationships at the species level, then obviously, uh, the best one would be the ITS regions in here because these sequences evolved quite fast and they will give you appropriate uh, variation in your DNA to make differences between different species. But nowadays, uh, things are changing a little bit now. It's evolving very fast. People don't only rely on... Uh, ribosomal DNA, they are going ahead and exploiting different types of genes as well, especially those from proteins. As you can see over here, here's a whole list uh, that people are exploiting nowadays. And they found that some of those protein coding genes are more useful than the ribosomal DNA when it comes to uh, species delimitation or when it comes to uh, trying to clarify uh, relationships are different taxonomic level so uh, apart from uh, rdna and protein gene example nowadays people are going mostly not only for single gene that is we don't analyze only one particular gene but they're going ahead for combined gene analysis of these that take the ribosomal dna and their protein genes and they combine them in a specific data set uh, and this has been shown to increase your accuracy and your resolution. It gives you far better uh, taxonomic resolution and it resolves some of the problems you have with morphology as well and with only our DNA. Uh, most of the combined gene phy phylogenies that we have, they are supported by morphological information and they minimize long branch attraction. You will see what is long branch attraction. Sometimes when you have your phylogenetic tree, you have only one specific lineage, one branch, which is rather long. So with protein and combined gene phylogenase, you tend to reduce those problems. Now with genes to combine, it depends upon your study. Sometimes you can be, you know, uh, you can be using our DNA and maybe protein coding genes such as those involved in protein synthesis, or you can also use one which is involved in glycolysis or sometimes even like beta tubulin genes. But it depends upon what you basically want to do and at what taxonomic level you are, you guys want to investigate your phylogeny. This is just to get you uh, a little bit in here. 
So uh, before you start with any type of phylogenetic study, try to get your sequences right, you know, because in, 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 in your uh, software that you use, if you put garbage in, you get garbage out. So basically, once you have your DNA sequences, you need to check it properly, whether these sequences are right, because if the sequences are wrong from the very beginning, you're going to get bad phylogeny. Okay, there are a number of questions that arises in here when we talk about how to delimit species. So how much sequence divergence should there be? How many genes should we analyze? How uh, to assess the reliability of specific gene markers? How distinct is one particular species? Is it new? Is it an existing one? How many taxa we should include in our phylogeny? How many support do we need to have to uh, infer species relationship, you know, what is the number of DNA sequences I need to analyze? So these are some or some of the questions or some of the possibly aspects you need to consider whenever you go ahead with your particular study. Okay, so try to make sure that whenever you go ahead with your phylogenetic or possibly morphological data, use reference sequences. You know, uh, try to use. Uh, uh, species uh, that should be based on phylogeny of core genes, okay, those having a strong phylogenetic signals, as I mentioned before, maybe ITS, and then you supplement it with one protein gene. Try to get enough of taxa on your tree as well, uh, maybe the maximum you can. And maybe if you're using the ITS regions, you need to try to decipher about, you know, uh, how many uh, variation should there be in your particular DNA region so that you can try to infer whether a species should be considered our same species or different species. Okay, so if you have a phylogeny, if you have a novel clade, a new a novel lineage, for example, okay, they should be quite distinct from other taxa. Uh, if you have phenotypic variation, as I said before, for example, with spore color, shape, size, you should treat them uh, with caution. Uh, sometimes it's also quite important to try to infer uh, host association and possibly if you have any type of pathogenicity criteria as well, which are quite important in segregating species. Okay. Are there any differences in morphological characters? Can these be used to a certain extent? Nowadays, people are going ahead with chemotaxonomy, that is the chemical profiles of different species, and it's being used nowadays in a chemotaxonomy. If you're going to describe new species, you should do it uh, maybe based on more than one strain. If you have a sexual connection, sometimes, as I said before, if you have a particular species that exists only uh, in its sexual state, sometimes it could produce its asexual state in culture. So maybe you can try to combine the descriptions as well and provide this information to the scientific community. Uh, now, which one to use, morphological data or molecular data, which is superior? I would go for both of them. It's not that molecular data is superior to morphological data or vice versa. We can try to complement each other because we understand that molecular data is a rich source of phylogenetic information, but we should not overlook our morphological data as well because this is basically our foundation on which uh, the whole description of the natural world rests. So the best approach would be uh, to use an in integrated one that is a polyphasic approach where if you can use your morphology, your molecular and even your chemotaxonomy, that would be perfect. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to, to thank Dr. Rex uh, for inviting me on this platform and sharing my knowledge as well. And thank you all for attending. <laughs>